test test. The committee will come to order.
Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee, not on the subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. This hearing is entitled, Building a Sustainable and Competitive Economy, an examination of proposals to improve environmental, social, and governance disclosures. I now recognize myself for three minutes. This hearing will address one of the most important topics in the markets right now, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG disclosures. This includes environmental issues, such as climate change, social issues, such as human rights, and governance issues, such as political spending by public companies. Investors overwhelmingly want companies to disclose ESG information, especially because there's now considerable evidence that companies that perform better on ESG metrics also perform better financially. In fact, over 2,300 investment managers around the world who collectively invest over $80 trillion have formally committed to incorporating ESG factors into their investment decisions by signing on to the UN-sponsored Principles for Responsible Investing. As a result of this investor demand, many companies already disclose at least some ESG information. This is a positive development, but I firmly believe that more must be done. The ESG disclosures that companies currently make often aren't as detailed as they should be and are difficult to compare across companies because they're not often standardized. I believe the best way to improve the quality and consistencies of these disclosures is for the SEC to establish standards for ESG disclosure that would apply to all public companies in the United States. Other federal agencies have already organized, recognized the importance of improved ESG disclosures. Just today, Commiss Commissioner Ross Benham at the CFTC announced the creation of a Climate-Related Market Risk Advisory Committee that will examine best practices for disclosing climate-related risks in the derivatives market. And I applaud Commissioner Benham for taking action on this important issue. But now it's time for the SEC to act also. Several of the bills we're considering today would require the SEC to establish standards for ESG disclosures. For instance, Mr. Vargas has a bill that would require public companies to disclose certain ESG metrics, which the SEC would be required to establish. To help the SEC in this task, the bill would also create a sustainable finance advisory committee which would advise the SEC on which ESG metrics companies should have to disclose. In addition, the Shareholder Protection Act would require public companies to disclose their political spending, which has been a long-standing priority for Democrats on this committee. Before I close, I want to say one thing about the idea that the SEC shouldn't mandate ESG disclosures because companies should only be required to disclose information that is material. First of all, that has never been true. The SEC mandates disclosure of lots of specific information that is not tied to the concept of materiality. And second, this relies largely on the SEC staff to know what information is material to each individual company and then to bring enforcement actions against those companies. But the SEC staff is in no position to second-guess companies about what is material to their specific businesses. And the SEC staff has to rely on the information the companies provide them in the first place. So materiality alone is not sufficient. We have to do more. I look forward to hearing from our witness on all of the bills today. And with that, the chair now recognizes the ranking member uh, for five minutes for an opening statement. And Mr. Heitzinger. Uh, okay, for uh, Mr. Heitzinger, for four minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Today's hearing t entitled Building a Sustainable and Competitive Economy uh, will examine these legislative proposals uh, regarding the environmental social goals and corporate governance uh, uh, provisions. What exactly are these ESGs? And uh, many claim that ESG investing is an investment strategy that focuses 
on incorporating ESG criteria into investment decisions in addition to the more commonly accepted focus on investments expected financial returns. However, ESG data and criteria span a range of issues, including, among others, uh, attempts to measure a company's carbon emissions, labor policies, human rights policies, whether the company engages in quote unquote harmful activities such as gun manufacturing or sales or cigarette manufacturers, the structures of corporate governance, for instance, whether the CEO and the chairman of the board of directors are the same person or whether a company issues dual class shares. Well, before a December meeting of the SEC Investor Advisory Committee, SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce uh, opined that the acronym ESG actually stands for Enabling Shareholder Graft. Uh, additionally, in a 2019 uh, speech in June, she likened the SG disclosures to that of scarlet letters being pinned on corporations without worrying about facts or circumstances. She went on to say that for some, naming and shaming, uh, quote unquote, uh, quote, naming and shaming corporate villains is fun, trendy, and profitable, close quote. It is clear that demands for ESG information have increased and many companies have responded by voluntarily increasing the amount of ESG information they disclose. But let's be clear, companies should focus on providing meaningful material disclosure that a reasonable investor needs to make uh, to inform decisions with. Uh, I can assure you that uh, if uh, they are seeing what has been claimed that uh, companies that do that uh, do quote unquote better, uh, then they will do it. Best practices will bubble up to the top uh, and they will be adapted. Uh, and uh, frankly, they should not be forced uh, on, to be done under the penalty of law. Um, after all, companies and boards that are, are best equipped to determine what ESG factors they believe are material to their individual business in order to create and optimize value for their shareholders and potential investors. What should not happen is that the government mandate these disclosures. Mandatory ESG disclosure, disclosures only name and shame companies, as well as waste precious company resources that could otherwise be used to create jobs, increase wages, grow the uh, company, expand capacity, maximize shareholder value. And any politically motivated action disguised as, as a disclosure mandate will just add yet another hurdle to an even greater cost of going public. Uh, which will only discourage more companies for doing so. And, and as we've talked about in this committee a number of times, we've seen a plunge in these uh, initial public offerings, these IPOs. And instead, we should be looking at ways to lower the costs and reduce barriers on those seeking to become the next Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, Google, the list goes on and on. Uh, over the last decades, activist shareholders and corporate gadflies have, have frankly hijacked the SEC and operate well outside its mandate and push non-material social and political policies. The SEC should be focused uh, on, uh, on uh, its current mandates of protecting investors, maintaining fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. I continue to emphasize that mandating these disclosures is only doing more harm than good. As the US IPO market steadily, steadily decreases at an alarming rate, the regulatory compliance costs for businesses continues to grow exponentially. It should be shocking to everyone that, there are, that countries like China are producing over one third of all of the IPOs that the world is seeing these days. ESGs do not help produce or launch more IPOs, and what's being proposed here today stands to reduce an already low number even further. We as lawmakers should be working to create an atmosphere that helps promote more capital formation, strengthen job creation, and increase economic growth, not harm it. Uh, with that, my time has expired. Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, for two minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for yielding and for including my draft legislation, the ESG Disclosure Simplification Act, in this hearing. I believe this hearing is timely. Environmental, social, and governance matters are growing concern and interest to the investment community. Investors increasingly view ESG disclosures as crucial tools and material information for evaluating a company's financial performance. Research has shown that companies that account for ESG factors tend to perform better with more stable returns. This is not about name and shame. This is about protecting investors in our economy and our environment. The use of ESG information by investors wouldn't have been possible without the pioneering, pioneering leadership of organizations like the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, which is represented here today. And I see that Mr. Mohan here, thank you very much for being here. 
As many of you are aware, last fall, a coalition of asset managers, nonprofit organizations, public pensions funds, and law professors filed a petition with the SEC for a rulemaking on ESG disclosure. That petition was the impetus for my draft legislation, which I hope will serve as a starting point for a larger conversation on ESG disclosures. I look forward to the hearing from the witnesses. Now I have to say also it is becoming more and more clear to my friends on the other side that climate change is real. It's not a Chinese hoax. It's something that's impacting all of us, all of our communities, here in Washington, D.C., certainly in California and throughout the world. And that's why I think it's important for this information to be readily available and to be standardized. So again, I thank those that have pioneered in this field. And again, uh, Madam Chair, I thank you for the opportunity of presenting. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. McHenry, for one minute. Well, I, I thank uh, the ranking, uh, the, the chair, and I also uh, thank the ranking member. Um, so Congress needs to be helping everyday investors. That's a that's a, a clear motivation, and the best way to help them is by making our public markets healthier and more competitive. Uh, stronger U.S. capital markets will encourage growth, which will lead to more investment opportunities and choices for everyday investors to grow their savings. These are good things. Unfortunately, compared to 20 years ago, families have roughly half the number of publicly listed companies to choose from when considering investment opportunities for their savings. That's a problem. I'm concerned that this hearing yet again misses the mark uh, we sh by ignoring these really important trends. Instead, at this hearing, we're going to be discussing costly proposals that increase barriers to capital formation, discourage companies from joining or remaining in public markets. Um, and these things hurt everyday mainstream investors and their investment opportunities. So it's time we consider and focus on serious policies to reduce barriers for companies and investors and um, make our markets much more competitive in the, and, again, the envy of the world. Thank you. Uh, today, we welcome a testimony from a distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, first, we have Tim Mohan, who is the chief executive for the Global Reporting Initiative. Second, we have James Andrus, who is an investment manager focusing on sustainable investments for the California Public Employees Retirement System, or CalPERS. Next, we have Paul Atkins, who is the CEO of Potomac Global Partners and who was formerly a commissioner at the SEC. Next, we have Dehas Wright, who is the CEO of Decanter Capital Management in Decanter, Georgia. Last but not least, we have Mindy Lubber, who is president and CEO of Ceres, a sustainability nonprofit in Boston, Massachusetts. Witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the permanent record. Mr. Mohan, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I thank the subcommittee for inviting me to testify at today's hearing. My name is Tim Mohan. I'm Chief Executive of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI. We are the largest standard setter for environmental, social, and governance, the so-called ESG information. Prior to GRI, I've held senior roles at three different major American companies. I also have experience in both the executive and legislative branches of the U.S. federal government. So I speak to you today not just as the head of the world's largest ESG standard setter, but as an individual who understands the complexities and pressures faced by American companies and also the importance of strong federal policy. Today I'll focus my remarks on the ESG Disclosure and Simplification Act. GRI welcomes this legislation. It will strengthen ESG reporting by companies and it will protect investors. And specifically, the bill will level the playing field for both companies and investors. It relies on international standards and by doing so, it will not, re it will not increase reporting burden because the vast majority of companies are already reporting and they're already reporting to the GRI standards. And it will protect investors by creating essential, clear, and comparable data. Let me just share some brief background on GRI to explain why we support this legislation. We were established in the United States by Ceres, uh, who's represented on the panel today, 
and we became an independent organization in 1997, over 20 years ago. Our success over 20 years is really based on the old axiom that you manage what you measure. All organizations, including the ones I previously worked for, run on data. And by identifying, measuring, and most importantly, reporting ESG topics, you tend to improve performance on these topics. And uh, this is not just some theory. I have seen this firsthand in the companies that I have worked for. Two of my former employers, Intel and AMD, have actually been reporting ESG information for over 20 years. For these leaders, it's not just about accountability with investors outside the company. This information is a very important decision tool inside the company. We created the GRI standards to provide the tools needed for companies to collect and report ESG information. But over the years, we have continuously improved these tools. Perhaps the most significant change we've made in the last few years was to completely revamp our governance model to become the world's only independent, international, multi-stakeholder standard setter for ESG information. And we did that by modeling our governance model on the same governance that the financial standard setters have. And largely as a result of this process, we are now the most adopted ESG standard by both companies and policymakers. Today, more than 90% of the largest 250 companies on the planet are reporting ESG information and 75% of those are using the GRI standards. Here in the US, the number is about 600 companies using the GRI standards, and about 80% of the Dow Jones industrial average. Globally, the market for this information is exploding. We had some information last year that the assets being managed with some form of ESG information are now over 30 trillion US dollars, and that's larger than the GDP of the United States. And it's grown by 34% in the last two years. It's growing because investors know that so-called non-financial information can have significant financial impacts over the longer term. And policymakers around the world have not missed this trend. They're following this trend. We are tracking right now 139 policies in 61 countries that specifically reference or require the GRI standards. 60 of those policies in 45 countries are capital market regulations. So just like financial disclosure, it's essential that this committee and policymakers around the world focus on a single global standard, because we need a common global language if we are going to unlock free trade and capital flows that increasingly depend on this information. So in conclusion, I want to applaud the committee for the ESG Disclosure and Simplification Act. It will protect investors, it will help unlock free trade, and ultimately, it will help align capital to sustainable business practices. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Mr. Atkins, you are recognized for five minutes. Oh, Mr. Andrus, you are recognized now for five minutes for your testimony. Chairwoman, excuse me, Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Heisinga and other members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the California Public Employees Retirement System, a reasonable investor, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is James Andrus, and I'm an investment manager for Sustainable Investments for CalPERS. I applaud and support the subcommittee's focus on building a sustainable and competitive economy. CalPERS benefits from a system that ensures accountable and transparent corporate governance with the objective of achieving the best returns and value over the long term. I will provide an overview of CalPERS and review various legislative proposals under consideration. CalPERS is the largest public pension fund in the United States with approximately $370 billion in global assets. The CalPERS Board of Administration developed governance and sustainability principles. These principles guide the internal and external managers of CalPERS when making investment decisions and provide the framework by which we execute our share owner proxy voting responsibilities and engage portfolio companies to achieve long-term returns. Our Board of Administration also adopted a five-year ESG strategic plan in 2016. My testimony is primarily based on the principles and ESG strategic plan. CalPERS strongly believes that all investors, whether large institutions or private ind individuals, should have access to disclosures that allow them to make informed investment decisions. 
We believe that enhanced data and transparency requirements will promote more efficient and sustainable financial markets over the long term. There are many substantive areas about which long-term investors could use more information. For example, as a member of the Human Capital Management Coalition, we joined others to file a petition with the SEC focused on human capital disclosures. I'm now pleased to discuss in broad terms CalPERS views on the bills before us today. I'm proud to say that CalPERS supports the direction of each one. First, our principles call for robust board oversight and disclosure of corporate charitable and political activity to ensure alignment with business strategy and to protect assets on behalf of share owners. We have consistently been in favor of such enhanced disclosure and therefore support the Shareholders Protection Act. Notably, in the majority opinion of the court in Citizens United, former Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote that, with the advent of the internet, prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. The First Amendment protects political speech, and disclosure permits citizens and shareholders to react to the speech corporate entities in a proper way. CalPERS agrees with Justice Kennedy on the material value of disclosure in this area and urge Congress, the FEC, or the SEC to implement these important measures. Next, climate risk disclosure. Detailed corporate disclosures regarding the impact of climate change on corporations' long-term performance are essential. Comprehensive disclosure of risk factors related to climate change should clearly re reveal how companies identify and manage such risks to generate sustainable economic returns. The Climate Risk Disclosure Act does this. Next, ESG disclosure simplification. Consistent with CalPERS strategic plan, the ESG Disclosure Simpl Simplification Act would require companies to make new and more robust ESG disclosures. This legislation would establish an inclusive process for advancing important pr proposals aligned with integrated reporting. Accordingly, CalPERS supports the approach. Fourth, corporate human rights. Our principles are clear with regard to human rights. Corporations should adopt maximum progressive practices toward the elimination of human rights violations in all countries or environments in which the company operates. In line with our principles, we advocate for policies, procedures, training, and internal reporting structures to ensure commitment to universal human rights. For those reasons, CalPERS supports the human rights proposal. Finally, country by country tax payment. Our principles focus significantly on emerging systemic risks and on fostering action that mitigates those risks. Current tax disclosures in the US do not provide investors with sufficient tax related information to adequately assess companies' values and risks. The legislation before the subcommittee would require the disclosure of overly aggressive international tax planning arrangements, thereby reducing systemic risk. We look forward to working with the subcommittee and committee to advance these and hopefully more proposals. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Atkins, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your invitation to discuss. Microphone. Sorry. Is it? Ah, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you for your invitation to discuss ESG disclosures and the SEC's uh, disclosure regime more generally. My written testimony provides additional background on SEC disclosure requirements and the legislation under consideration today. I would like to spend my allotted time focusing on the significant costs that disclosure mandates impose on businesses, large and small, investors, workers, and the American economy. Over the years in administering the disclosure regime under the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act, the SEC has generally focused on the disclosure of information it believes to be important to the reasonable investor. The SEC explained in 1975 that the requirement that information be material is, quote, necessary in order to ensure meaningful and useful disclosure documents of benefit to most investors without unreasonable costs to registrants and their shareholders. While many seem to believe that disclosure is costless and harmless, the costs are real. 
Most significant is the direct cost of the, of the disclosure, which for just three provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act was estimated to total more than $2 billion annually. Disclosure overload is neither an imagined nor a new concept. It is being used as a blunt force instrument by special interest groups and policymakers alike to attempt to impose normative outcomes. It's being decried by members of the SEC and the Supreme Court for decades. Yet mandatory disclosures have only grown, and there is a growing body of evidence that indicates these ever-expanding and ever-complex disclosure mandates hinder the goal of a sustainable and competitive economy. Data show that expanding and complex mandates dissuade companies from going public. During the past 20 years, IPOs have been on the decline in the United States. In 1996, there were more than 600 IPOs in one year. Almost a decade later, there were fewer than 300 over a two-year period. This downturn doesn't just affect investors, it affects the broader American economy. It's estimated that as much as 92% of job growth occurs after an IPO. A study by the Kaufman Foundation looked at companies that went public between 1996 and 2010 and found that they employed more than 2 million people in 2010 than they did before they went public. The Treasury Department under President Obama recognized this problem and in 2011 created the Private Sector IPO Task Force. The task force surveyed CEOs and found that almost 75% cited public disclosures as their biggest concern about going public. Of the public company CEOs surveyed, 92% named the burden of public reporting as one of the most significant IPO challenges. An interim report by President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness noted that regulations have resulted in fewer high growth entrepreneurial companies going public. In 2012, led by members of this committee, Congress enacted the JOBS Act, which recognized that the public company disclosure regime inhibits companies from going public. The law established a regime to lessen those requirements on new emerging growth companies. Beyond company decisions, many ordinary investors are losing out on this valuable investment opportunity, especially compared to high net worth individuals who can more readily participate in private offerings. The venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz compared the return multiples for tech firms of the 1980s with newer tech firms in the 2000s. In 1986, Microsoft returned just over 200 times uh, in private value creation, while its public value creation was roughly 600 times. Oracle had similar return ratios in the same year. Now contrast this with Facebook in 2012 and Twitter in 2013, nearly all of whose returns were private. Since the passage of the JOBS Act, the number of IPOs per year has been almost 190, compared to an average 100 per year in the five years prior to enactment. While this is a significant improvement, there still is more that can be done. Unfortunately, while all of the bills under consideration today are undoubtedly well-intentioned, the reality is that many of them set requirements already provided elsewhere in law at best, or would mostly engender the type of unintended consequences that prior efforts have visited upon public companies, their investors, their employees, and U.S. economic growth. I'll be happy to answer questions so that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Wright, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Hazika, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you this afternoon to talk about the proposed legislation that will provide greater disclosure of material information for investors. My name is Degas Wright, and I'm the founding principal of Decatur Capital Management, an institutional investment management firm focus on global and sustainable equity strategies, serving public pension plans, corporations, and individuals. My comments provided today should not be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any of the securities mentioned. I am an investment manager who conducts company research to manage equity portfolios on behalf of our clients. Therefore, my interest in environmental social governance issues is based on the discovery that these items may provide material information First, allow me to define material information or materiality. It is the information that is a reasonable shareholder 
would consider is important in deciding how to vote a proxy, purchase, or sell a security. The legislation requesting disclosure of political contributions addresses a relative new material factor in the selection of securities. A recent CEO's survey reports that more than half of the interview CEOs believe that the uncertainty of current political landscape has a larger impact on their business than in the past. These firms and their executives view political contribution as an effective tool to address political risk to protect shareholder value. Our research indicates that as political risks increase, political contributions increase. Therefore, political contributions may define the level of the corporation's political risk. We found that the majority of large corporations' returns were impacted as news of political and or regulatory risk increases. The stock prices decline. Based on our research, we have found that political contribution as a proxy for political risk is material in making investment decisions. The legislation requesting disclosure of climate risk addresses a complex material impact on security pricing. This risk is difficult to measure for several reasons, since the risk parameters may be mispriced due to shortcomings in the available information. I will not address the science or legal issues regarding climate risk. As an investor, I attempt to model risk factors and I treat climate risk as a factor. The best measure for materiality is the capital markets. A number of corporations have developed sustainability reports that include current levels of emissions and emission targets. This information should be required of all listed securities. Based on our research, we have found climate risk to be a material item in making investment decisions. The corporate tax legislation attempts to address potential tax avoidance risks. The amount of corporate income tax a company pays is material to its profitability. Investors therefore seek to understand the extent to which future cash flows are impacted by a company's tax liabilities. Therefore, corporate tax avoidance activities, while perfectly legal, may suggest underlying regulatory or reputational risk. The legislation requesting disclosure of human rights and value chain risk are material factors in the selection of securities. It is easy to understand that news of human rights violations can impact the reputation and the stock price of a corporation. Again, a number of firms have human rights and value chain policies. We recommend that all listed securities be required to provide this information. Based on our research, we have found human rights risk to be material in making investment decisions. We support the creation of Sustainable Finance Advisory Committee to advise the Securities Exchange Commission on the evolving issues to ESG materiality and capital markets. Thank you for your time. The oversight work of this subcommittee is critical responsibility, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Ms. Lover, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Great. Good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you for your leadership on taking up these important bills. Uh, my name is Mindy Luber. I run Ceres, a national organization that works with hundreds of influential investors and companies to tackle a number of the world's sustainability challenges, including water scarcity and pollution, deforestation, inequitable workplaces, and climate change. I appreciate the opportunity to be here to share our views on corporate disclosure of environmental, social, and governance issues, and to voice support for the various proposals being heard. I'm going to speak in further specificity to the Climate Risk Disclosure Act of 2019, which we strongly support. These bills are firmly rooted in the principles of transparency, of materiality, and of investors' needs for adequate information to assure long-term returns. One of the things we do at Ceres, we run a network, an investor network on climate risk and sustainability with 106 institutional investors collectively managing over $26 trillion in assets. And since our founding 30 years ago, our members have consistently felt that sustainability challenges pose material financial risks and that these risks need to be embedded into our capital market systems. There are some who like to believe that sustainability risks are not real financial risks. But let's be clear, risks are risks and they need to be disclosed, whether they come from trade agreements, from fluctuating commodity prices, from inflation, 
from currency changes or climate change. If they are real, if the risks are clear and material, they ought to be analyzed and disclosed. And it doesn't matter which box or category they come from. We have a long history at Ceres in the field of disclosure. As Tim said, we founded and launched the Global Reporting Initiative in 2007, and it is prospering with 13,000 plus companies reporting. And in 2010, Ceres and our investor network members petitioned the SEC to issue the first of its kind climate disclosure guidance. Despite the issuance of this guidance, which I will say is not being enforced, our research shows that half of the 600 largest United States companies still do not provide decision useful disclosures on climate related risks. Those that do often provide disclosures that are mere boilerplate or just too brief and effectively meaningless. So investors right now are simply not getting the information they need to understand how their portfolios are exposed, which in turn exposes them to potential losses. Mandating those disclosures, as you were suggesting to be done, will help companies better understand their own exposures and opportunities. And these rules will help stimulate their ingenuity and their strategic thinking. It will increase their competitiveness and create, not harm, but create shareholder value. Or as the long-held business school mantra suggests, what gets measured gets managed, and with adequate, adequate and relative information being measured, companies will manage their climate risks and do so better. And mandatory reporting, as you suggest, will create a level playing field where all companies, every company is required to provide the same information in consistent ways. Climate change is the greatest economic crisis of this decade and well beyond. And its implications are real we can analyze them and they need to be disclosed. Nearly every sector of the economy is impacted, from food to agriculture, to transportation, to energy, to apparel, to technology, and on and on. Which is why so many companies, from Apple to Levi Strauss to The Gap and others, are disclosing those risks. They are real and they are material. Consider the following. More than 200 of the largest global companies reported almost $1 trillion at risk from climate impacts, with many of those risks likely to hit in the next five years. And our research shows that companies that do provide climate disclosures are more likely to set relevant goals and to have systems in place to make them more resilient. So while we applaud the companies that are showing leadership, voluntary reporting is simply not enough. It is not consistent. All players should be required, and the mandatory requirements laid out in this act are thoughtful, they're carefully designed, they meet the needs of investors without unnecessarily burdening companies. These risks can't be always be avoided, but with the right information, they can be managed. And when the risks are fundamental, investors and companies need that information. Thank you for your efforts to make those disclosures real and available. I think they will change the course of information in our capital markets. We strongly support them and look forward to seeing them. Thank, thank you very, very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, uh, first, Mr. Andrus, as you know, opponents of ESG disclosures have been claiming for years that these disclosures aren't material to investors. Even though we see more and more evidence every day that ESG disclosures are material to investors. So as an investment manager at one of the largest institutional investors in the world, I would like to ask you, do you consider ESG disclosures to be material? Thank you very much for the question, Chairwoman Maloney. Yes, all of the bills that are presented today would require the, pres the presentation of material information in the regulatory reports. There's much discussion with regard to materiality without a full analysis of what materiality happens to be. There's not one def definition of materiality. The TSC court, which focused materiality on voting, um, is limited to things that happened in the past. The basic court focused materiality on probability times magnitude, which focuses on things in the future. 
However, the SEC in item 303, which focuses on forward information, has a two-pronged test for what needs to be reported. And in that two-pronged test, all of the information that is presented today would fit within the current definition of materiality. There's some crit criticism, not only of materiality, but that of what reasonable investors want. I consider CalPERS to be a reasonable investor, as well as most of the largest investors in the country. All reasonable investors all desire to have more of this information presented. It's not limited to this country. The demand for ESG is a worldwide um, issue. Investors from around the world, all of whom I consider to be very reasonable investors because they have the same responsibilities that CalPERS have to pay money to beneficiaries, are focused on these issues. So yes, these issues are clearly material. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wright, do you agree with this? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mohan, uh, do you think the SEC could effectively build on the great work that your organization has done in establishing ESG metrics for companies to disclose? Mike. Yes, yes I do, and in, in my testimony, I, I made uh, a point about why that's important. Uh, as investment flows and capital flows increasingly rely on this information, it's important to have international standards. So if we draw a parallel to the financial standards, a few decades ago, it was more uh, sort of a patchwork system and as we had the International Financial Reporting System and the FASB come together, now we have basically one system, and it has unlocked free trade. So it's very important to look at a single global language, and to do that, you really have to focus on an independent, international, multi-stakeholder standard setter like GRI. Uh, could SEC standards essentially complement your organization's standards? What I would recommend is that SEC, like they have done with FASB, uh, refer to uh, an independent standard setter like GRI. That way you get the state of the art, it stays up to date. Uh, Ms. Lover, are you, as you know, some companies already disclose a limited amount of information about the risks of climate change. But as you noted in your testimony, these disclosures are often inconsistent across companies and very often incomplete. Do you think uh, Mr. Caston's bill would require companies to include sufficient detail on climate risk for in investors, and how important is it for the SEC to include industry-specific guidance on climate risk disclosures? I think it is perfectly consistent with the SEC's role and mandate. Their role is to protect investors, to assure material risk disclosure. They do it for many other issues. This notion that if it sounds environmental or social, it can't be a real risk. But the risks are real. They are very real. They're very costly for a company who doesn't have enough water. The water risk is in hundreds of millions of dollars to PG&E that just found itself in bankruptcy because of the climate-related um, climactic changes that caused the fires. We're seeing billions and billions of dollars. Those risks are risks investors need to know, and the SEC is the place with the kind of guidance offered in your bills um, to structure the kind of material risks and disclosure of those risks so they're consistent with all other risks that companies are asked to disclose. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the, the distinguished ranking member for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wasn't going to go here first, but I, I just was struck, uh, Mr. Andrus, uh, in your written testimony, you noted that, quote, Kelper's primary responsibility is to our beneficiaries, end quote. You talked about uh, investing over the long term, and I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, however, uh, one analysis of Kelper's decision to disvest uh, itself or divest itself of tobacco-related products cost the fund, uh, and thus hardworking Kelper members, over $3 billion. It doesn't uh, strike me that losing money like that is in the best interest of your funds beneficiaries, either short term or in the long term, uh, particularly at a time when CalPERS is uh, not fully funded. And I'd, I'd like to note, Madam Chair, and, uh, that uh, CalPERS newly elected president, Jason Perez, who is a police officer from Corona, California, seems to believe that losing money isn't in the best interest of his 
funds beneficiaries either uh, in campaign materials that, that he sent to eligible CalPERS voters last year. He criticized former CalPERS president uh, Priya Matura of, uh, of putting CalPERS members' retirement security at risk, quote, due in part to environmental, social, and governance investing priorities regardless of investment risk, close quote. So, um, Mr. Uh, Atkins, as former commissioner with the SEC, uh, what impact do, does the, uh, you talked about this in your written testimony about the IPOs, have on employment and job growth, and, and what does an uptick in U.S. IPO uh, uh, charters uh, mean for mom and pop 401k investors and others? Well, there. Uh, well, thanks for the question. There are a, a lot of effects uh, from a robust IPO market. One is uh, particularly as a way for um, private companies to have an exit ramp to be able to then, uh, you know, attract more capital and not just uh, be, um, you know, private. Uh, do, do these do these bills encourage IPO uh, pro the process in your opinion, or do they uh, encourage companies to identify and attract new investors, or is this going to drive more of that into that? that private capital world? Well, like, well again, uh, I, th I think that uh, Im imposing these sorts of detailed uh, disclosure requirements, especially on smaller companies, in my own experience, and as have been uh, reflected in the surveys of CEOs and others, that that is the one that's bi biggest impediment for people wanting to venture into the uh, uh, There's been a lot talked markets. about the responsibility of the SEC and the responsibility of, of uh, corporations and um, uh, I've been dealing with uh, Section 1502 implementation from Dodd-Frank. I, I wasn't here for the passage of Dodd-Frank, but we've been living with the echo effect uh, of that, and, and that had to do with, uh, with what uh, I think everybody universally would agree is a, uh, a positive um, uh, attempt uh, at, uh, at curbing a very real issue uh, dealing with conflict minerals, but uh, in, in its economic analysis, of the final rule, the SEC said it's going to cost uh, compliance is going to be between three to four billion uh, initially, and then 207 to 609 million uh, a year. Uh, Mary Jo White, uh, Obama's uh, President Obama's uh, SEC uh, uh, commissioner and chair, uh, had talked about the, the, what the proper role of the SEC should <laughs> be in all of these things, and 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 I'm I'm curious as a former SEC commissioner. Yourself, would how would you feel about another group that has been suggested by Mr. Moen uh, setting standards that the SEC then needs to follow, uh, and uh, rather than uh, rather than them coming up with those standards themselves or letting industry come up with that? So I'm curious what you think of that idea. Yeah, well, I think it's best to leave it to the uh, uh, the industry, the private markets, to uh, come up with the standards rather than designate yet another. Uh, something like FASB or GASB, uh, you know, these various uh, other groups uh, to do that. Um, so let, let's talk uh, in kind of finally here um, about our competitiveness internationally. I mean, we are seeing IPOs go up a little bit. They're not nearly at what they had, uh, at the, where they had been. And I'm just curious if you believe that the federal government needs to force under penalty of law uh, companies big and small to disclose this kind of information. Uh, uh, Mr. Mullen in his testimony noted that uh, some of his clients have been doing this for 20 years voluntarily. Uh, is it necessary for the federal government and through the SEC to come in with a hammer uh, and, and enforce them and, and maybe put them into a form as had been suggested that not even the SEC would determine but that an outside group would determine? Yeah, it, uh, it undoubtedly raises costs, and it's not just the cost of putting the disclosure together to hire lawyers and all that, but it's the knock-on costs of threat of litigation and that sort of thing. And I'll just note, Madam Chair, as my time is up, but uh, I do believe that the most effective way of doing this is to make sure that this is voluntary by these companies, uh, demanded by uh, clients, customers, investors, beneficiaries, rather than having the federal government uh, mandate this. So with that, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and again, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Atkins, let me ask you a follow-up question, if I may. Do you think that climate change is real? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it's uh, certainly a, a topic of discussion, and uh, but I don't think that really matters. I, you don't think climate change matters? 
No, it doesn't matter what I think. I mean, I, you know, I, well, I take it does that. today. That's why we have you here and it certainly matters to me. So do you think climate change is real? And if it is, do you think humans have impacted it at all? You know, there are studies uh, that show that's the case. So, um, you know, I haven't really studied the study. So um, anyway, but obviously it's a topic of discussion in the public sphere and, and elsewhere. Have you followed it at all? Well, of course, as uh, in uh, newspapers and things like that. And have you come in to any conclusion yourself? Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of data out there that shows uh, various ways. So I don't, uh, I haven't really uh, come to any part. So of you haven't that. come to a conclusion one way or another? Not that, not that I focused on. No. Okay, I think that's the problem. Um, I think it's interesting. When I was in law school, one of the big issues was the issue of the ozone depletion. And we took it seriously as a country, and we took it seriously as a world. We knew that the CFCs were, in fact, destroying the ozone layer, so we came up with alternatives, and the world invested in these alternatives. And we found out that, in fact, you can see Mother Nature cure herself. Um, and it's interesting that here, you know, the person here that's been testifying and saying, you know, doesn't know if it's real. You know, when most of the scientists, in fact, virtually all of them point at climate change and says it's real. We see in California, the fires are bigger. We see they burn hotter. We see all the flooding. It's interesting, uh, one of the groups of people that I've met in my life, they're real cold-blooded, are insurance actuaries. Now, I used to be a vice president of Liberty Mutual. I could tell you, these people, they have cold water that runs through their veins. They simply look at the numbers. And it's interesting, these events that were happening every 100 years or 200 years, and they're happening in much shorter time periods. Something is changing. It's obviously climate change. All the scientists tell us that. There's a couple kook scientists that say otherwise, but all the scientists point the same direction and say, of course there's climate change. And that's why I think it's so important to have these disclosures. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sorry that you know, the, uh, the United States isn't leading on this as we should be and taking this seriously and not thinking it's some kind of a hoax. But I do want to get back to the issue of the destruction of shareholder value. Mr. Moen, I heard here that, in fact, these disclosures will destroy shareholder value. It sounds to me that it's just the opposite. Studies point the other way, do they not? They absolutely do, and I wanted to uh, thank Congressman Vargas for this legislation. It's, it's fantastic legislation because, you know, this, these issues, climate change, human rights, ethics, diversity, environment, health, and safety, these are critical issues. And, you know, if they were disclosed in an orderly fashion, then I think investors and companies would have far more information to make these all-important decisions. If, uh, in fact, they were included in the financial de definition of materiality, we might ha not have these massive issues that we're facing today. So it's very, very important to level the playing field. And if you look at what's happening in the world today, with the majority of companies, all the big companies, reporting using the GRI standards, it's obvious the trend line here. Companies are seeing it's important. Investors are asking for the information. So it's already happening. Uh, I think what's important for this subcommittee is to level the playing field so that we don't have those companies that are kind of lying in the weeds and not stepping up and reporting. Mr. Anders, do you agree with that? Do you agree that, in fact, this is valuable information for an investor like yourself, for CalPERS? Thank you for the question. Yes, it is, it, it is valuable information. It's information we track. And it, in, in this particular case, we're asking um, you to basically instruct the SEC to make it um, a regulatory item such that we, have, we get comparable information from all of the companies. And then we can shut down some of the noise on some of the issues that some other people, in fact, and in fact, complain about. I think the items that are before you are critical issues that we track um, and, and we look forward to additional disclosure. <clears throat> Again, I thank all of you for being here. My time's almost up. The only thing I'd like to say is this. Climate change is not the only thing, but it's super important and we have to take it seriously and start making decisions that impact it in a way that's positive, not negative. And I uh, have four seconds left, so I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And ranking member of the full committee, Mr. McHenry, is now recognized for five minutes. I yield to my colleague from uh, Arkansas, Mr. Hill. I uh, thank, uh, thank my friend from uh, North Carolina, and I appreciate uh, all the witnesses. Very informed uh, group and very helpful to the committee's work. 
And I do come at this from the point of view that our officers and directors of our companies have a uh, legal obligation in making, uh, taking their obligations very seriously as a fiduciary under the business judgment rule. Uh, and therefore, uh, something that's material should be disclosed. If it's a risk factor and it's material, it should be disclosed. If something's material financially, it should be disclosed. Uh, not only for the five years covered by the 10K, but you know, in the out years so that in shareholders can be informed. Uh, and that's a fundamental part of our, our system is that issue of materiality. And, and as a general statement, uh, I think they, they do that. I've been a public company director, I've been a, uh, a investment manager, so I understand, uh, I understand that. And we balance that with the cost associated with uh, these issues. And so it's a very careful balance, just like uh, Mr. Zanga, my friend from Michigan, talked about uh, the views of beneficiaries at CalPERS uh, doing that. And it, it seems that that over $130 billion shortfall, or whatever the number is now in CalPERS, has caused some beneficiaries to uh, question um, that uh, these decisions to not invest in certain categories were, you know, maybe a bad decision in retrospect after doing the study he cited. But there's a bigger issue, which is there are fewer public, public companies. And so this issue is there are fewer things for CalPERS to invest in. So I think that's why we are so diligent here about uh, balance. Conflict uh, minerals, uh, Mr. Atkins testified about the cost of that. I got a letter from a chief accounting officer of a two billion in market cap company the other day that's active in my, has representation in my state. And uh, she told me that they have one billion in revenue in this company and that conflict minerals cost them $250,000 a year to comply with that rule and they had no certainty really whatsoever if they were doing a, a good job or not. And she went on to tell me that in Form SD, she'd never had one question from an investor about the filing uh, from their investor relations department about uh, conflict minerals. And this is a company that sources different uh, things in their uh, inventory from around the, the world. Um, also, come at this from the point of view that if we are reporting things that are material, then we can't just go from one subject to another and compel something is material because somebody thinks it's material, if it's not material in the judgment of these fiduciaries that we've appointed as board members. I quote uh, here from a Fortune 500 board member, we're asked as a corporation to take a public stance on very complicated issues. We've got crime in the cities. We've got a hundred, no, we've got a thousand complicated issues that are very material to our civilization. But if we spend our time in the meeting taking public stands on all of them, I think it'd be quite counterproductive. I don't like the fact that people are constantly present this issue and never discuss a solution. And so I think our companies are sensitive to their philanthropic objectives, um, et cetera. But uh, that director was Charlie Munger at Berkshire Hathaway. His colleague Warren Buffett on the issue of climate change and insurance companies, and since they're a big property and casualty insurer, they said there are more material things on any one year that are more material to their pricing, and that in property and casualty pricing, uh, that changes every year. You're not making a hundred year decision and you're able to reflect those different risks. Um, my final comment on this was I read an article just the other day, and here's the quote, a climate disaster triggered by the continued burning of oil and coal could result in the submergence of Florida, Holland, and other low-lying areas over the next 50 years, according to the Ohio State University. Uh, do you all agree with that? Somebody agree with that? Because this article was written on February 2nd, 1978. So I don't know that while we're concerned about these issues, if they're material to a company, I think they ought to be disclosed. Mr. Atkins, are there penalties if you don't disclose materials, material information? Uh, well, severe penalties from the SEC, but then also private litigation. So I think if it's material, officers and directors ought to have the right to determine that and customize it for their report and not be compelled to a uniform standard set by somebody else. I thank my friend from North Carolina. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes.
Thank you so much, Chairman Maloney, and um, thank you so much to the panelists. I, uh, I'm excited to be here today, and I'm very proud to have introduced the Climate Risk Disclosure Act uh, with Representative Cartwright in the House. There are more than 200 of the world's largest listed companies who have forecast that climate change could cost them a combined total of almost $1 trillion. Uh, according to a report from the Carbon Disclosure Institute, but investors largely lack access to the basic information about the potential impact of the climate crisis on American companies, and not just companies. The, when Chairman Powell from the Federal Reserve was first here, not this morning, but when he first came earlier in the, in the year, I asked him whether, whether our Fannie and Freddie mortgage lenders were factoring in the risk to a 30-year mortgage in low-lying areas, and his comment was that that was, would be an interesting thing to think about, but he wasn't sure we did. That's a big deal if you're taking the other end of that risk. And there ain't nothing wrong with having transparency of information, despite what some folks here have said today. And I, and I just would like to remind people that the SEC was not created in order to allow businesses to hide information and protect their profits. It was created to compel businesses to disclose information and protect investors. Capitalism is a awesome thing. It depends on competitive markets and we, we best not forget that competitive markets depend on transparency of information, no matter how much we as business owners don't always want to provide all that information. The, to that end, the Climate Risk and Disclosure Act would require public companies to disclose more information about their exposure to climate-related risks, which will help investors assess and, let's be clear, hedge those risks and effectively remove the subsidies that currently accrue to companies that aren't aren't mitigating those risks. Risk and reward are related, right? And if people don't know what your risk is, they get to hedge it. So that's the point of it. That's why 33 groups have endorsed the bill and are committed to addressing the necessity of climate risk disclosure. I'd like to ask the chair for unanimous consent to, to enter into the record this letter of support. Thank you. Um, how's my time? Close. The, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, set up by the G20's Financial Stability Board, found in its report that climate-related disclosure had improved since 2016, but only about a quarter of companies disclosed information aligned with more than five of their 11 recommendations, and there was only a 3% increase from 2016 to 2018 in the number of firms disclosing. I'd like to start with Ms. Luber. It's clear that some companies generally disclose climate risks, but those disclosures are typically very vague and don't always provide investors with a good sense of the scale of the risks that the company faces from climate change. Do you believe that the qualitative and quantitative disclosures of climate risks required by the Climate Risk Disclosure Act would be a meaningful improvement on the status quo for investors? I think there's no question. The risks are real, they can be calculated, but they need to be consistent they need to be um, comparable company to company. Investors need that information, and the SEC ought to mandate the disclosure of it. You know, we're talking about, or some of your colleagues, somehow this is an extraordinary extra burden. It ought not to be seen just as climate risk. It is a material financial risk, as you talk about. The SEC knows how to regulate that. They regulate it for inflation, for currency, for trade they could regulate it for the material risks of climate. And I don't believe the burden is that high. I believe it is doable, manageable, could fit in under the regimes that they have. But it ought to be, as you designed in your bill, consistent, comparable, and frankly, mandatory. So the laggards don't get away with not doing it while the leaders do. So, so Mr. Moen, I was, I was delighted to hear about what GRI has done. This is going to date me a little bit. 20 years ago, I did one of my first jobs out of grad school was doing life cycle carbon modeling. Um, for companies like British Petroleum using a lot of WRI data. Can you help us understand, if we were to adopt these rules tomorrow, do companies need to reinvent the wheel for how to, how to actually go through and calculate these risks, or is, through the good work that GRI and WRI and others have done, are the, are the templates largely in place at this point? The templates are largely in place, Congressman, and they continue to uh, evolve and grow as the megatrends of having this information go from sort of more the reputational space into the global capital markets, the, the uh, disclosures have become much more uh, professionalized and the taxonomy standardized. Okay, um, last question with the time I have left to Mr. Wright. Can you help me understand what the long-term risks are to investors in companies that fail to disclose these risks? Yes, it's very important. And one of the things that we're seeing is that many companies have already taken that upon themselves. 
to start reporting voluntarily this information. However, the information is not consistent. And that's the information we need to really understand the transitional aspect and the impact it has on our employees and also investors. Thank you. Yield back my time. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chair, and I certainly thank our witnesses for being here to testify today. The United States continues to experience a slump in the number of new businesses, which in 2017 hit a 40-year low. The U.S. is only seeing half, half the number of domestic initial public offerings, or IPOs, that it had seen just some 20 years ago. While at the same time, the U.S. doubled the regulatory compliance costs a business must incur. While the U.S. IPO market is steadily decreasing, foreign markets, particularly in China, are growing. Instead of placing additional burdens on public companies, we should be encouraging more growth and more IPOs here in the United States, which will lead to more investment opportunities and choices for Main Street investors. Main Street investors, real people, to grow their savings and their retirement accounts. Commissioner Atkins, I too am concerned about the decline in American IPOs over the last few decades and the growing trend of American companies opting for private capital as opposed to public markets. Meanwhile, China's IPO market, are you ready for this? They produced over one third of the world's IPOs in 2017. China, which makes the decline in American IPOs even more troubling. Why should we find these trends concerning, sir? Well, I think, uh, you know, well, first of all, it's uh, a, a robust public market is uh, a good a democratic uh, type of uh, situation to have where people are going out to the public to, uh, to raise capital rather than just a private uh, um, investors. And it's ch a lot cheaper to do it with uh, private investors. Um, the, way that, the way things are now, and you're subjecting yourself to a lot more regulation if you go to the public markets. Double, double in the last 20 years. Would the bills discussed in today's hearing create additional requirements on American public companies adding to their regulatory compliance costs? Oh, I definitely think so, yes. How would the bipartisan capital formation provisions from the Jobs and Investor Confidence Act of 2018 help encourage more U.S. IPOs and make us more, more competitive globally? Well, a number of those provisions, like, for example, taking aim again at uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Section 404 uh, is one example of uh, unintended consequences of a lot more burdens on smaller companies. And so the provision of that act uh, uh, you know, extend the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know that situation there for uh, smaller companies to uh, not have to be subject to that is just one, but all the others there that would increase access to capital and uh, and uh, I think would be very helpful for uh, for growing companies. What else? What else should Congress be doing or not doing to well, make to make U.S. capital markets more attractive? Well, uh, reduce the regulatory burden. We talked about the conflict minerals provision of Dodd-Frank. That was a huge gift to consultants, uh, all sorts of consulting firms. To, even if you look at your credit card, Citibank and others have to analyze that strip of uh, metal in the back to make sure that there are no conflict <laughs> minerals in it. So that adds a huge burden even to the largest companies like that, and as well to the small ones. Any other things that you can, can, can cite that... Um that would, would, would make U.S. capital markets more attractive, certainly from a regulatory reform? Well, we have, uh, well, for the, so as uh, Chairman Clayton and his colleagues are doing at the SEC, I think taking a, a real examination of 
uh, the, the regulatory rule book uh, that uh, is there with respect to uh, um, going public in the United States and, and remaining public. For example, uh, you know, they're looking at corporate governance and other things. Because right. when, oh. oh, when, when you look ahead. at ESG, I mean, G, as Barbara Novick of BlackRock says, G is the most important part of uh, the ES and G. Thank you. I appreciate uh, General Lady. And I would quickly. yield. Yes. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. In the remaining seconds here, it just again, it strikes me as we're hearing testimony about uh, companies using and doing things without government mandate. It begs the question of whether we have to have the federal government come in and force them to do these things that they see as good practices. So, with that, I yield back. Thank you. I yield. Thank you very much. The gentleman now from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, a newly released report from the London School of Economics examined instances of legal action on climate change for a 30-year period uh, ending this year. Uh, the report found that climate change cases are on the rise worldwide, and to date, climate change litigation has been brought in at least 28 different countries, with about three-quarters coming from the U.S., Increasingly, plaintiffs are making claims against investment funds and companies for failing to incorporate climate risk into their decision making and for failing to disclose climate risk to their beneficiaries. Um, Mr. Andrus um, Wright and Ms. Luber, uh, what can the rise in climate change lawsuits tell us about the need to, for more high quality climate risk disclosures by companies? Uh, Ms. Luber? Well, certainly we're seeing more lawsuits, not only as it relates to investors, but as it relates to fiduciaries, board members at companies. Uh, and being somebody who trains corporate board members on the financial issues of climate of water, uh, what they're telling us is they want more information, they don't want to be sued, they see their duty. One of the first duties of a fiduciary of a company is to analyze risk and act on it for the company. So I think one way to make sure that we're not seeing lawsuits prevail is for people to have the information so they could act as responsible fiduciaries and respond to the very real issues. But there's no doubt we're seeing more litigation in many parts of the world around climate change, and that will just grow. I think so there more, are ways to head it off through yeah, better management. More clarity on the, the responsibilities to report um, and to factor these in would probably reduce the amount of litigation. Is that? I'm sorry, could you? But if, you, if you, there was more clarity on the exact responsibilities to, to factor in climate change into, into policies and decisions, then that would likely reduce the amount of litigation that you Precisely. see. Precisely. Precisely. And, and the information that's being asked for is consistent with how the SEC does their business. It is not a massive new corporate burden. I mean, there'll be definitions, but as defined by the bills, we're just looking for material information that allows companies to manage themselves better and investors to know where their real risks are and where they aren't, and it allows fiduciaries, corporate board members, to know where their real risks are and where they aren't. And we all know better information leads to better decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other comments, Mr. Andrews? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Congressman. Basically, based upon what you're saying, it's additional evidence that what we're talking about is actually material and there's an actual need to have this information disclosed on a regulatory basis. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Wright, as you noted, this in, noted in your testimony that as an investment manager, you measure climate risk for clients. And as part of that analysis, you routinely measure a company's baseline carbon emissions. Uh, however, of the 186 firms you evaluated, only 18% report their current level of emissions. Uh, so could you uh, say a little bit about um, how having comprehensive information on emission levels for all companies in this sector might be helpful in making investment decisions? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Basically what we found is that environmental news can impact future stock prices. And so as we have more information that's positive, that would actually benefit our holdings. So as we get more information, we can make better decisions relative to the stocks that we own. And to include the fact that these companies are making transitional plans, so we want to see what their future plans are, where we can price that into the uh, stock valuation. Thank you. And so I guess that pretty much excludes my, completes my question, and so I'll yield back the balance of my time. 
Thank you very much. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. I appreciate um, your expertise in coming here and sharing it with us, um, and frankly, your passion for environmental social goals, and, and I think more uh, on the underlying basis for the high-functioning capital markets that are the envy of the world here in the United States. Uh, you know, I, I think when you think about fiduciary duties, uh, you know, from what I gather, many of you simply want to look at a broader definition of a fiduciary duty. So that the fiduciary duty involves not just quantitative things like discounted cash flow, uh, but an essay question on, well, how do you feel about these environmental social goals uh, that, that are out there? Uh, some of you might say if you properly take those into account, you would get the same discounted cash flows uh, across the board. I'm just curious, all of you are involved in some level uh, in, in the investment sector, and I'm, you just go down the line. Um, you know, does, your, does your firm currently employ ESG uh, in their investing practices? Yes, Thank or you, no? Congressman. We're a standard setter, so that wouldn't apply to GRI. Yeah. Next. Yes. Yes. Uh, we're a consulting firm, so. Uh, no. No. Yes, we do. Yes. Uh, and of our 160 investor members whose assets total $26 trillion, they all, in one way or another, are analyzing ESG risks and incorporating them. Thank you. And, you know, while we heard previous uh, testimony that the, that the, uh, the companies that use uh, ESG outperform those that don't, the studies on that are varied. And, frankly, even with Cal CalPERS, Mr. Uh, Andrews, you you uh, highlighted that the CalPERS does use ESG as part of its metrics. And um, I'm just curious, is CalPERS currently considered to be fully funded on its pension obligations or underfunded? Congressman, we are we're underfunded, but it's important to point out that what's being discussed here is focused on disclosures, which yep. is additional, additional transparency. Got it, and, and appreciate that. So, when I look at, uh, for the record, Jason Perez, former CalPERS, uh, or CalPERS board member, he says he estimates that it costs CalPERS uh, $8 billion uh, for divesting from tobacco, for example. Uh, and so, while tobacco was performing well, you can appreciate people on an individual level deciding, I'm not going to invest in tobacco. And at some level, a firm, you might feel that way, but an institution, uh, when you're reserving and you're fully funded, that's one thing. When you're underfunded, I just talked with some of my teachers from Ohio today, and what they wanted to know is their, their retirement is secure. They don't want to take wild risks, and maybe you felt that you, you were protecting people not just from the harmful effects of tobacco, but from a p potential crash in the value of tobacco. And it, you know, some of the bets turn out wrong in every investment. Uh, in fact, for every long, there's a short, right? And so uh, when you look at the, the information that you're seeking uh, to standardize, uh, people would draw different conclusions on that. I just don't understand how that's different than the market functions today. Uh, for example, Mr. Atkins, my concern, without the, in the current practice, using ESG goals, uh, American Century Sustainable Equity Fund divested itself from ExxonMobil but it increased holdings in ConocoPhillips because their corporate governance practice they found better. Same sector, different return. Do you see examples such as the one I described often as it pertains to ESG funds? Well, part of the problem is with the whole ESG concept, it's very squishy. And so even a lot of the, uh, the, the types of frameworks that are out there, it's uh, very difficult to pin down exactly what it means. And here's the closing thing I would say. Heavily institutional investors are relying on proxy firms. So proxy firms um, are required uh, or are permitted by the institutional investors uh, when they take uh, corporate proxies. Not required, but the proxy, proxy advisors dominated by two firms, 97% of the market, and they're already employing ESG. They're already influencing the market. They're influencing the, the practices of institutional investors. And I think it would be really nice to have a hearing at some point in the future on how proxy advisory is already influencing ESG. And with that, I yield. 
Thank you very much. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Luber, you spoke of the relationship between performance on environmental, social, and governance measures and company performance. As a matter of fact, in your written testimony, you, you state this. You say disclosure is valuable for its ability to stimulate ingenuity <clears throat> and strategic thinking by businesses which can improve sustainability performance, increase a company's competitiveness, and in a resource-constrained economy, and create shareholder value. That is a very good statement and a worthy one. Could you share with us a little bit, go into a little detail what you meant by this and uh, how influential you feel the company's performance is on these environmental, social, and governance measures to their overall performance? Maybe you can give us an example. Take a, an environmental issue like climate change. How, how does that relate to the company's performance? Great. And, and then give me an idea. We talked about the example of the environment. What, what would be a social change? Sure. Give us an example of that and the climate change and tell us how that works. Sure. Uh, very quickly on the social side, when Nike many years ago was found to be employing in their supply chain in Southeast Asia, young children sewing and stitching their soccer balls, that was a reputational catastrophe that hit their bottom line. And so they said, we've got to be doing better, not only on the east side, but on the east side. We want to know who's making our products, what standards they're being held to. If there are contractors, should those contractors be held? to the same standards, and it's not only Nike, PepsiCo. PepsiCo has a program, Performance with Purpose, and they've got goals on social, environmental, and governance issues. And what that has done is it allows them to better manage their supply chain and know who's doing what. It allows them to better manage the risks from water problems and climate problems. And by doing that, they're providing, they're studying the performance of those issues they're disclosing them, and the disclosure forces them to manage it better. When they know that they've got human right risks in their supply chain, they are acting and acting quickly. Well, let me ask you this, because you brought up the Nike thing. The most recent one is this business of the Betsy Ross flag on the sneaker, brought up by Kaepernick. How do you, how do you evaluate that uh, with truth and honesty. I'm, I was very torn with that. I'm a sort of patriotic fellow. Yeah. I love so, this country. Right. The, it, you're asking a great question. And I will say reputational harm to companies can run to the shareholder value. Again, when Apple found out in their supply chain that there were toxic chemicals being used in some of the resources that went into the phones and what that meant on the health and the, of their workers, that was a huge reputational risk. So it does matter. Um, what we saw at Nike, and not everything could be valued immediately. I'll come back to places where you can more precisely value it. When you come back to Nike, when they first put out the Colin Kaepernick ad, my understanding is, first of all, it was a very thought out decision by their board of directors. They knew it was a risk. When they first put it out, they saw a slight drop in sales. And then in the week following it and the week since then, they've seen a straight uprise in sales. So the public does vote in what they purchase and they are looking for, all the polls show, uh, companies that are consistent with the values of those consumers. So you're saying in essence that on this particular situation with Nike, and the Bet Betsy Ross flag, that Nike made the right decision? Well, what I'm saying is the consumers 
uh, I'm saying that they made a decision, and uh, it, it almost doesn't matter, just as Mr. Atkins doesn't know everything about um, climate change, I don't know everything about it, but what we saw is, as it relates to share value, the strength and profitability of that company, they did well, and they did well, and they are hearing it from their consumers. So the fact of the matter is not every issue could be evaluated completely, but that's an example where we're seeing positive feedback from the most important people to Nike, their consumers. Thank you very much for your very well thought out insight. Thank you very much. The gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So look at these proposed bills, Mr. Atkins, let me just ask you this. The, the proposed bills requires companies to disclose, companies to disclose country by country reporting of tax payments. In your opinion, are the employees of the SEC international tax, are, are, are the employees, are the employees of the SEC's internet, are they, in, are they uh, international tax experts with intimate knowledge of the tax laws of dozens of countries? And if not, do you think it's appropriate for Congress to pass an SEC disclosure bill, knowing that the SEC cannot review the disclosures for accuracy? Yeah, I think that's very problematic. And I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, largely those things are probably, depends on the company, but probably immaterial. And FASB and the financial statements uh, already require a material uh, uh, to solve, to working on solving capital formation issues that are hindering American companies, entrepreneurs, and mom and pop investors. Uh, I think these bills are pushing you outside of your area of what SEC's mandate is, so. Um, I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Well, I think I've made my point. I know there's a lot of other people in the queue, Mr. Chairman, so I'm happy to yield my time back to the, uh, to the ranking member or to, right, I'll just yield. Well, if, if the gentleman will yield. Sure. Uh, gentlemen, I'll yield for a moment. I, I'll take care of this little piece of business because we, uh, I do want to submit for the record. Um, uh, uh, five uh, different articles. First article being an article from the Wall Street Journal titled, uh, Kelper's Dilemma, Save the World or Make Money? Question mark. Without uh, objection. The second is a report from the Institute for Pension Fund Integrity. Without objection. Uh, the third would be a report from the Pacific Research Institute. Without objection. And the fourth would be an article from Market Watch titled uh, Opinion, ESG or Socially Responsible, Funds May Soothe Your Conscience But Could Weaken Your Portfolio. Without objection. And the fifth and final one would be an article from Chief Investment Officer Kelper's President Loses Her Board Seat. Without objection. All right, and uh, so I wanted to get that little piece of business and I think as my friend was uh, making the point and as I was trying to make the point in a much shorter period of time with my colleague from Missouri, um, we have heard time and time and time again so far from the panel about how private businesses uh, have made decisions. I happen to think it's stupid that Nike uh, pulled the Betsy Ross flag shoes, uh, but that is their decision. It's my decision whether I go and outfit myself with Nike or not. Um, the, uh, th there, are, there are things like that that businesses make those decisions all the time. The question is, is who's going to decide what the next, next Betsy Ross flag is or not, and whether that should be part of somebody's social justice portfolio or not. Uh, I happen to think that it was a fairly innocuous flag from 1774, I believe, or three, as I recall, before we were even declaring independence. Um, that didn't seem like a current social statement to me. In fact, it seemed like it might have been a workaround for the commentary on the current 50 star flag that had been of, uh, of, of some uh, consequence at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, who's going to be making those decisions? I sure in the heck don't want it to be the SEC. And I certainly don't think that it ought to be some sort of other sidecar institution that the SEC has handed off that responsibility to. Now, I'm okay with a privately held company making those decisions and all of us voting with our, uh, with our, with our wallets, uh, but that's a very different equation than having the federal government come in under penalty of law deciding what those standards are that, uh, that these companies should adhere to. So I uh, appreciate my friend from West Virginia yielding me his time and uh, I yield back to him. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, is now recognized for five minutes. 
Hello, uh, Mr. Atkins, you were an SEC commissioner from 2002 to 2008, and some pivotal things happened during that time, like, the, yeah. like the setup for the global economy blowing up. Um, and a key uh, part of your job at the SEC during that time was to regulate the biggest broker-dealers. And under, while you were at the SEC, they began the, what's called the Consolidated Supervised Entity Program, um, and the SEC created this to oversee those banks. And there were five banks in that program, including um, some who are no longer with us, like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, um, a couple survivors like Merrill Lynch. And the whole point of that program was for the SEC, through supervision, to make sure those banks didn't collapse. Um, do you recall how did those banks feel about this new CSE program and this new alternative, alternative capital standard they had to meet? Uh, I, I don't uh, recall offhand, but... Uh. Okay, so um, they were actually quite happy. Um, Lehman Brothers wrote that it applauds and supports the SEC for adopting this new rule. And so the five biggest banks were in this program in 2004, five, six, seven, eight, while you were at the commission. Um, did the SEC assess the stability of those banks before you enacted the CSE program? Uh, well, that was uh, the staff in uh, trading markets, uh, and I was assured by them that they had the capability and the, uh, the wherewithal to uh, administer the program. You were assured by the staff that those banks were stable and would be well supervised by the CSE so program. They had the wherewithal to administer the program as we were adopting it. Well, so there were definitely issues with those banks right at the start um, that the SEC was fully aware of. One of the other commissioners, Harvey Goldschmidt, said during a 2004 meeting, quote, if anything goes wrong, it's going to be an awfully big mess. Do we feel secure if these drops in capital occur, we really will have investor protection? Did you have any similar concerns and did you express them? I did. As I said, I, my, my question of the staff was, do you have the resources to properly administer that program? And I was So sure. despite the fact that while you were at the SEC as a commissioner, these banks became highly leveraged, were given a weaker capital requirement and supervision, and a disastrous crash did in fact occur, all under your watch. You've then publicly railed against labor unions, environmental, gay rights groups, challenging the practices of big banks through shareholder activism. And in fact, you called companies who cave to social activism weenies. And that is a direct quote. So you personally presided over the most disastrous financial downturn since the Great Depression. You did not stand up to the big banks. Why are you in a position to call other people who respond, other corporations who respond to their shareholders, weenies? Well, I think that's a, that was a very unfair characterization. So first of all, I, w I didn't preside over it. I was a member of the commission. And uh, so that's a, a body that, uh, like this one, uh, adopts rules and, and uh, is the, the... You'd like this committee to do more strict oversight over the SEC? Because I'd, I'd probably be there for that. No, if that's I, what I, you're I, suggesting. I'll, I'll inform your I was current commissioners. The roles of a, of a commissioner to, uh, uh, to you know, a member of this committee. But, not, but be that as it may, there were many other financial institutions that were much more heavily levered than, uh, than the... Uh, banks in the CSE program, but the staff, like I said, had assured okay, me. Okay, let's stop there. Let me reclaiming my time. I, what is your job now, Mr. Atkins? I am a CEO of a consulting firm here in Washington, Potomac Global Partners. And what do you charge as a consultant? I'm sorry. What do you charge as a consultant? It ver I mean, it varies. It depends on the project and things like that. So I don't. I guess I'm struggling in. A capitalist economy as a capitalist to understand why anybody would pay you big bucks when you in fact didn't stand up and were a weenie in the wake of the financial crisis and then are labeling other people that the duty of a corporation mr chair that's inappropriate that, yeah. those are his quotes we should you those just are his him a weenie. we should take down her words mr chairman um was the just to understand um in the 
Time has expired. Let me just understand the quote. Are you quoting material that uh, Mr. Atkins, so is it a direct quote from Mr. Atkins that you're quoting? Yes. He has called companies, quote, weenies, quote, who often, quote, cave, quote, to social activists. I don't recall that. So. Mr. Chair, I believe she called him a weenie and uh, point of order. <laughs> well, let me ask you, Mr. Atkins, that, that, do you? That is different than a quote, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to have my time reclaimed from this, from this discussion. Rule 17, rules of decorum, Mr. Chairman. My understanding that um, the witness is not a protected class. It only applies to members of Congress. So let me just ask you, Mr. Atkins. Uh, did you Your time has expired, though. So I apologize. Were his objections? Your, excuse me? Because of the objections? There was about three seconds left, and I believe that your time was expired by the time that the objection was made. I, I, that's what I think I saw. I could be wrong. Um, I feel very confident that I have made my point. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I would insist on my point of order that we keep decorum in the, in the hearing room. That is the obligation of the chairman. Yes, and, and again, uh, we, we will keep decorum. Uh, direct quotes, of course. Or I've heard things even from our president that I wouldn't repeat. Um, but again, those are uh, direct quotes, and I believe that the quote was a direct one. But thank you for the objection. Okay. Insist on my point of order. Quorum is established and the point of order is not sustained. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Mullen, how much do you make? Pardon me? How much do you make? Uh, I'm not sure that's material to the hearing. No, it's, uh, this is, this is uh, all about disclosure. Um, the gentlelady from California wanted to ask Mr. Atkins that, so how much? I believe my uh, remuneration is publicly available in our annual report. So no, what is it? Uh, it ranges uh, each year, depending on- What was it last year? Uh, 250. Mr. Andrews? 300,000. What's that? 300,000. 300,000, Mr. Wright? I have uh, elected not to answer that because uh, I'm a uh, business owner and I have I a- we're about uh, disclosure here, this is transparency. But however, uh, I have You're gonna decline not to be transparent. Ms. No, Lieber, how, much, how about you? Uh, 230 and it is fully disclosed in our 990 and available to the public. Thank, thank you. Um, so Mr. Moen, uh, when we, we talk about uh, things that should be disclosed, are there some harmful um, uh, activities that you think should be disclosed to the public. So in the banking sector, if, if, if banks bank certain industries, should that be disclosed? Thank you for the question. Uh, sir, we are a standard setter. So our role is to create the world's best standards using multi-stakeholder so Standards for banks. Should banks disclose who they bank? The disclosure uh, based on our standards is really a matter for companies and the regulators of those companies. So we set the standards, others so choose should, to use so them or not. I want to know, if, if you in, in invest uh, in you know, a, a gun manufacturer or a gun retailer, is that something you think the public should know? Again, sir, our disclosure Somehow, do, you, do you think we should know that? As a standard setter, it's not something that we Or about whether on. you invest in abortion clinics or THC or whether you support um, the American flag or whether you'll bank detention centers. Are those things that you think are important for the public to know? Actually, it's a quite an interesting question because our independent standard setting board actually chooses which standards go through that process. And none of the issues that you just mentioned have actually made it through that process. And so by employing the world's experts on terms of what is a sustainability issue, none of those has actually gotten through. 
uh, so, to the point that Mr. Huizinga made, some of these do thing, these issues do bubble to the so top. On the social side, what, 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 what do you want to disclose on the social side? Well, we actually have uh, our disclosure standards. We have 33 topic-specific standards. Give me a couple. What are your favorites? Uh, human rights, uh, ethics, uh, environment, uh, health and safety, some of the basics. So on the framework. environment side, who sets the environmental standard? You guys do? You set, you set, the, you set well, the priorities? No, no, we don't set the standards. The experts, we have subject matter experts from Set the standards on, on what you should do on your environmental standards. So you have okay. your experts internally. Not well, internally, how? no, sir. They, externally. They, they come from industry. They come from civil society. How are you funded? From, pardon? How are you funded? Uh, we have sources of funding that are 70% self-funded and 30% from so grants. Do, if you look at the, the political spectrum on who funds you, is it are they down the middle of the road, no political persuasion, left, right, who funds you? Of the 30% that's grant funding, it's uh, majority government. So we have fundings from government that actually cite our standards in their legislation. I would note that uh, I, I think we should be focused um, less on your uh, ESG, um, uh, ESG requirements and we should focus on returns. And that's what CULPRA should probably do as well. Uh, because, you know, if they continue to perform the, the way that they have, I'm sure they're going to come to this institution and their members will come to this institution and say, we want more money. We want you to bail us out. Um, and I guess, Mr. Atkins, um, to, 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 to get your opinion, I, I think what this is is uh, to try to set up disclosures to put pressure, political pressure on companies to do things that the Congress could never pass itself. So if you, wanna, if you want a, a companies to comply with different standards, um, whether, you have, whether it's global cooling from the 70s or global warming from the 90s or now just climate change today, um, pass it through the Congress, right? Uh, or if you don't like guns, debate it in the Congress. But I think what you want to do is get disclosures so you can put political pressure on companies to get them to change what they're doing because of political pressure. Am I wrong on that, Mr. Atkins? And if I am, you can tell me I am. Well, sometimes uh, that's what uh, you know, either, as I said in my testimony, either uh, government or others uh, try to use uh, for normative reasons. And to your point, I, I think you, you, you express some concern when you're asked about global warming. Uh, I think if you look at the predictions that have been made over the last 30, 40, 50 years, most of them have not come to pass. Many of them have not. And so that you might go, how, how accurate have the predictions been? Even from, we go back to Al Gore's movie, the, many of the predictions that were made didn't come to pass. And so um, I don't, uh, I, I think that we, I don't know, my time's up, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Andrus, um, have you ever read the article that was submitted into the record, Save the World or Make Money, about CalPERS? No, sir, I have not. So what is your goal as an investment manager at CalPERS? Who do you work for? Who do you consider your fiduciary, and what you do you consider your goal? So, I work I work for the board of administration. They are the fiduciaries of the cap. Of the I'm cal sorry. Who do you work on the benefit for the benefit of? I work for the benefit of our pensioners and the workers of the state of California. And what do you can you explain to the folks in the hearing what happened? in the chairman's race recently for the board of, of your pension? Mr. P Mr. Perez won, won a, a board election. And, and in, in, the, in, the chairman's, in the chairman's race, the board then, sel then selected another oh, I'm chairman. I'm sorry, the, the, so the chair of your board lost her board seat, correct? Correct. What was that issue over? I've no, I do not know. I do not know what the issue was. What the issue was over. I I do know so what I, Mr. Perez ran on. Okay. All I know is that it says here that uh, it was, um, you know, angry pensioners and beneficiaries that uh, felt like the fund was not focused enough on returns. What is the annual return of CalPERS? Uh, I saw something that said it's about seven percent. That sound about right? 
That, that is our discount rate. Over the last 10 years, we've been above that. Okay. And, uh, and you recently changed, had to change your amortization policy from 30 years to 20 years on investment losses, which forced all the um, pensioners and the, um, the uh, public uh, folks who, who fund those pensions to increase their contributions. Is that correct? That happened last year, February 2018. Is that correct? That is correct. That's not the reason why that change was But made. the result was that pensioners are paying more money and local governments are paying more money. Is that correct? That is correct. So um, it seems to me that if I was an investment manager at CalPERS, I'd be a lot more focused on increasing my rate of return for my pensioners because they're the ones who are suffering right now. And, um, and I hope you'll focus on that. Um, I have nothing against you know, environmental stewardship, sustainable social governance and all that, but I think the key thing here is about the policemen and the firemen and the public workers that need the best return they can get. And um, I appreciate your answer to my questions. Um, Mr. Adkins, who decides materiality for a company? Uh, well, the company itself uh, in, in their disclosure. Who's in the best position to decide materiality for a company? Well, again, the company itself. I, th I think so, too. Um, and are there a lot of societal issues we could decide that, gee, this is a great social justice cause? I'm, I'm sure among us all. I believe the answer is yes. But is the most important social justice cause for a pension to provide pensions for their pensioners? That's what it's instituted to do. Yeah. That's their, isn't that their purpose? Yes, sir. Um, and if it doesn't benefit that purpose, is it helpful to the pensioners? Maybe, but if it hurts the return, and it could hurt the return, it could actually damage the, the pensioners. And what happens, we've already had this asked and answered, but what happens to the number of public companies as you increase disclosure requirements on public companies? What choice will companies make on becoming public? Well, we've seen that overall regulatory burden, including disclosure burden, uh, causes companies uh, not to choose to go public. And what does that do to mom and pop investors? Uh, well, it provides them fewer choices for investment. So if you're a big pension like CalPERS, you can get access to private equity, is that correct? You uh, still invest in those companies? Depending on the rules that the But if you're a mom and pop investor and you're a small business owner, do you have those same opportunities? Unless you're an accredited investor, probably not. Probably not, and especially on Main Street in, in Logan, Ohio, and in Lancaster, Ohio, and Pickerington, Ohio, that I represent, and um, and I, I'm all for, you know, folks that uh, want to use environmental and social justice as their investment strategy. But for those folks, uh, aren't there companies that voluntarily disclose and give people options? Oh, sure. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Vargas. Again, uh, this has been a great panel and informative, and thanks for your forbearance and uh, being here this afternoon. <clears throat> there were a couple of bills that I haven't heard much discussion about. One was on uh, disclosure on corporate taxes being paid that was proposed. Um, and uh, again, it struck me as I was confused because, in my experience, corporate taxes are, are disclosed pretty well, you know, I think, and I've pulled about 10 different public companies to look at their tax disclosure in their 10K. Did it cover federal taxes? The answer was yes. Did it cover state taxes? Yes. Did it disclose the taxes they paid internationally? The answer was yes. And it also tends to, in the footnotes, reconcile those and, and give some additional commentary, depending on how complicated the company is. Again, unique to the company, unique to this issue of financial statement preparation. Uh, Mr. Atkins, do we need this additional direction on taxes, tax disclosure? Well, I think it's problematic. Again, it's, it's very focused, very detailed. Uh, as you were saying, I, I used to be a... Or what would investors gain from that compared to what people were reporting and have reported for decades now? 
Well, already companies need to report material information regarding their taxes, their tax liabilities, um, and litigation and, and that sort of thing. It, has it also seemed to imply that there was some interest in knowing um, business around the world, and of course, of our Fortune 500 countries, 50% of them, I mean, 50% of revenues of the Fortune 500 are international, so I went and pulled for many of these same companies, does it disclose their business by country or region? And the answer is yes. I just pulled Procter & Gamble for 44% in the U.S. and Canada, 24% of sales in Europe, 9% in China. So I'm, I'm missing something again in this bill if this is necessary. Do we need more segment analysis? Are we missing something there? Yeah, again, I, I mean, this is, it's very narrowly focused on uh, tax issues by country. Okay, thank you for that. And then another bill that I noted was on uh, uh, political uh, or, I guess, political expensing or lobbying expenses maybe, and this bill doesn't have a bill number, either Shareholder Protection Act about uh, corporate expenditures over $10,000. Uh, again, I, I've seen uh, companies have proxy proposals on that year after year, and they just don't tend to pass. I think there were about 60 companies that had uh, something related to disclosing lobbying expenses or political contribution expenses, and they got about 30, a third of the vote in favor. So is there, what, what, have, what in your experience as a commissioner, what's, what's the issue here? What, what am I missing on this? I mean, they have the ability to uh, proxy, so have a proxy solicited, um, go through a process in the annual meeting, and people don't seem to be, <clears throat> don't, they don't seem to be interested in that information. Well, by and large, these uh, sorts of uh, proposals fail, um, and at a couple of companies uh, here and there they've passed, uh, depending on the particular circumstances of the company, but overall, shareholders reject these yeah. Well, I guess my main point is here, I agree with so many of the comments made today that companies have uh, an obligation to disclose materiality, things that will impact their business and their shareholder investing, whether it's related to uh, climate change because they have risk associated with that. They have an obligation to disclose material risks now. Uh, the key thing I think that's important is we they have that obligation, they have civil and in some cases criminal penalties associated with not reporting material standards. And the beauty of our system is in fact that it's unique to each country. I mean, each company determines that board and that management team with full input. We have shareholder activists. We have institutional investors that some of you represent, all engaging in that conversation. And so I view these bills while interesting ideas and uh, uh, well-meaning, I just don't think that they're, they're needed and that these issues are being addressed now by boards of directors, shareholders, uh, corporate officers, and our process that we have now. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. What's the chairman, uh, ranking member wants to? I yield back. Thank you very much. Before we wrap up, I'd like to take care of one administrative matter. Uh, without objection, I'd like to submit letters and statements for the record from Paula DiPerna of the Carbon Disclosure Project, Public Citizen, Council for Institutional Investors, the FACT Coalition, Principles for Responsible Investment, Morningstar, Professors Cynthia Williams and Jill Fish, TIAA, and the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable. I'd also like to thank our witnesses today. I think the information was very valuable. I know it got a little rough there at points, but I appreciate very much uh, you being here and your testimony. It's, it's, it's invaluable, so thank you. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness, witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able to. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is now adjourned.